Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to the fourth and last Tasman District Council webinar in this round of engagement on Eureri Ki Uta, Eureri Ki Tai, Tasman Environment Plan. This webinar covers all three of the topics that we are looking for feedback on. Managing Tasman's environment and development, towns and villages, and from the mountains to the sea, visions and values for our freshwater and coastal waters. Today, I'm joined by Barry Johnson, Lisa McGlinchey, Jeremy Butler, and Mary Honey, who will be doing a short presentation on where we are up to with the development of the plan and the topics that we are currently asking people to give feedback on. Barry is the Environmental Policy Team Manager. Lisa is responsible for fresh, the Freshwater Portfolio and leads the Natural Resources Team, working with air, land, freshwater, and coastal parts of the regional plan. Jeremy handles transport policy and leads the team working on policies for urban and rural areas, natural landscapes, and a long list of other areas. Finally, Mary is responsible for towns and local centres and terrestrial biodiversity portfolios. Feel free to type in any questions that you have as you watch the presentation, and we'll address them during the presentation if we get the chance, otherwise we'll answer them at the end. I'll now pass you over to Barry, Lisa and Jeremy to take you through the key aspects of the TEP that make up this round of engagement. Muted. Sorry, good evening everyone and, and thank you. And the uh, final presenter of course is Andrew Smith who's just introduced us all. Uh, look, we're going to take you through a bit of an overview first and then we'll get into um, that further into the detail of uh, what we're looking at and what we're consulting on at the moment. So just as a little bit of context, we'll take you through a little bit of background. Clearly the landscape's changing in terms of RMA plans and, and, and government reform and things at the moment. So just to just so we're clear on you know what we're talking about tonight and, and apologies if you know this already, but um, councils are governed by the Local Government Act. They're, that's the piece of legislation that, that creates councils and, and de, uh, drives what they do. And there's a host of strategies um, and plans that councils are required to do. A big chunk of the work that, that councils do, of course, is um, environmental legislation or environmental management through the Resource Management Act. So that's environmental policy, um, what we're talking about tonight, it's resource consenting, um, it's monitoring compliance and also environmental information as well. So a big chunk of what councils do is around the Resource Management Act and environmental functions. Um, the uh, Tasman Environment Plan covers uh, two components of that. It's council's requirements to do a or, or develop and implement a regional policy statement and also implement uh, resource management plans. And as Tasman is a unitary authority, then those plans cover both the regional council functions and district council functions. So it's a bit of a one-stop shop in terms of that. So what we're talking about tonight is very much the regional policy statement and the resource management plan. And in terms of the Tasman environment plan is creating a new plan, which will roll those into one. So uh, next slide there, Jeremy. So currently we have the Tasman regional policy statement and the Tasman resource management plan. These, these were started and um, basically off the back of the RMA in, in, in 1991. So they've been around for a long time. Um, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of reviews over time. Um, the law requires us to, to review our plans every 10 years, um, but a little bit like the Resource Management Act, um, the Tasman Environment Plan has been reviewed and tinkered with multiple times over the last 25 years. So parts of it are very up to date, parts of it um, are very old. And there's certainly a number of things, new national policy, particularly around the likes of fresh water, um, and productive land where um, there's a requirement to, to update our plans to reflect what that national policy guidance is and to give it, give it that local flavour. So we take the RMA and we take the national policy, we put a local flavour on it and we implement it in a way through these plans, through the blue book at the moment and, and whatever colour the new TEP is going to be, um, to provide us with basically the, the environmental rule book or the environmental plan that, that reflects 
what the Tasman community wants in terms of environmental outcomes and how we manage growth and how we manage our environment in terms of that. Um, however, uh, next slide, Jeremy, the, the elephant in the room is that it's all changing, a little bit like three waters. The government's side of the RMA is, is no longer fit for purpose, and um, I don't think many people would disagree with that. And um, it's going to be replaced with three new pieces of legislation. So under that legislation, I won't go through those, um, we're, we have we will have obligations or councils will have obligations to develop a regional spatial strategy. Um, in some ways that will be very similar to the future development strategy that Nelson and Tasman currently have. So the new legislation and the government has said that Nelson and Tasman have to do combined plans. Um, we're already doing that through our future development strategy. And over time, that is likely to morph into our regional spatial strategy. Underneath that will be the Tasman Environment Plan or a new combined resource management plan with, with Nelson. And um, in between that uh, structure plan, so they give us a little bit deta more detail and they're a flexible tool to enable us to, to get a lot more feedback from the community that can feed into our environment plans. Um, so we're well placed. I guess um, given with all this change, you might be saying, well, what's the point of going through this consultation at the moment? It's all going to change. It's all, it's, it's all up in the air. Um, I guess what I would say is that what we do know about the new system is there will still be plans. Um, the environmental issues will, won't change. They will always be the issues. And at a high level, the options we have for, for addressing those issues aren't going to change. So, you know, your views on, on what the big issues, the environmental issues are for Tasman aren't going to change just because the law changes. Um, we might have a few more tools or different tools in the toolbox um, to actually address those, those big issues and, and affect change or to manage our environment. But, but in some respects, the new system will still land us in the same place. So the work we're doing at the moment and the issues we're consulting on tonight um, and over this period are really critical because the, the, the feedback we get from, from the community will help to shape ultimately what goes into those new plans, whatever the new law and the new framework looks like. So what we're doing tonight is critical. It will be enduring um, and it is a very important building block for, for where we head in the future. So. Um, just before I hand over to Jeremy, uh, just in terms of process, we started this process of reviewing the Blue Books, the, the Tasman Regional Policy Statement and Tasman Resource Management Plan in 2018. We had a first round of, of consultation or community engagement in 2020, and that was just checking in. We reviewed, we kicked the tires on the existing plans, what was working, what's not working, where are the gaps. Um, and we checked in at that stage with, our, with the Tasman community saying, well, if we got it right, um, what are the big issues? We had a pretty good idea what the big issues were, but you wanted to check with the community that that was so, were there any things we'd missed? Is there anything else we needed to include? Um, we've done that. We're coming back now. We've, we've actually heard from our community. We know what the big issues are. Actually, the now is coming back to a community and saying, hey, okay, you know what the issues are? Here's some options for how we might address that. What do you think? What do you think the best way forward is in terms of addressing the environmental issues for Tasman? So that's where we are at the moment, and that's what we're talking about tonight. So very important. So I'll hand you, I'll hand you over to Jeremy. Jeremy will take you through uh, where we are, uh, what we're consulting on, um, and how you can provide feedback. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Uh, yeah, that's great. So yeah, Barry's given a really good summary there just to sort of set this broader scene. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, zero in on the um, the three discussion documents. And I'll talk about the first two, and then Lisa will talk about the um, uh, the, the Mountains to the Sea document. So just to recap, uh, yeah, my name is Jeremy Butler. I am the team leader for the Urban and Rural Policy Team. So uh, we deal with, uh, my team deals with um, everything to do with you know, the, sort of the people side of things, if you like, and that's the towns, uh, villages, all our rural areas, uh, sort of how the environment interacts with with people and the way people live. Uh, so there's the, the first two, uh, if I just go on, so this is the first document, this is sort of what the cover looks like, and it's uh, a community discussion document for how, uh, for aspects of managing Tasman's environment and development, and it's to do with, as the byline says there, how we'll live, work, travel, and spend time in Tasman District. Uh, so the, some of the topics that are involved, I'm going to run through these, um, the topics that are included in this document, uh, and, and just give a bit of a discussion on each one. Now, what I'd say from the start, though, is that 
Um, this isn't all the topics. Uh, the um, for, for for workload and and sort of um, be able to step these things through um, one at a time. This is about half the topics that the TEP covers. Uh, and so um, sometime next year, probably the middle of next year, there'll be another set of topics which we'll be coming to have feedback from the, um, the community on also. Uh, so, um, but th this, this first set of topics here, uh, one of, the, one of the, um, the topics that it goes through is the regionally significant issues. So under the uh, legislation, the Tasman Environment Plan, that we have to identify what are the regionally significant issues. And these are issues that have particular uh, importance or particular weight and all other, um, and, and the policy that we make has to be consistent with these issues. So there's already a, a bunch of issues that we've identified that are in our current pl plan and we're proposing to add climate change, which is obviously a, a new but <laughs> clearly emerging uh, large topic that will uh, affect everybody in Tasman. Urban growth and infrastructure. Uh, everyone will have seen the, the level of growth and, and development that's been occurring in Tasman uh, and, and that we need to uh, provide for that and recognize that as a regionally significant issue. And then community well-being. And that's something uh, to, you know, this new way of looking at uh, well-being. It's something we need feel we need to include as a regionally significant issue. Uh, then the next topic that's covered in, in this first document is the uh, matter of outstanding natural features and landscapes and our coastal environment and coastal natural character. Now, this is very much around how people perceive these landscapes and these coastal areas. Uh, we've, uh, you may well have seen some of the work that's been done. We've uh, been consulting on this a couple of times over the last couple of years, particularly with the landowners who, uh, who have land, which is considered to be outstanding natural landscapes. Uh, so these are areas, a lot of it's covered by our dock estate, our national parks, Kaharangi and uh, Rotuiti National Parks and, and the Able Tasman. Uh, but there are significant areas where, which are actually in private ownership too. So we've been work, developing some rules, some concept rules for what activities meet down there at the bottom of the slide around earthworks, quarrying and mining, buildings and structures and plantation forestry. What? How, how can those uh, should those activities be accommodated in those outstanding landscapes uh, in the coastal area, or does there need to be some restriction on those? So we're proposing some concept rules for uh, for, for those um, special locations. Uh, then the um, the discussion document goes on and looks at our urban areas. So we have uh, around about 16, depending how you define, uh, towns and villages. And uh, they are spread obviously right across Tasman. And they really, uh, and I'll come onto these in a bit more detail later, but at a higher level, uh, they, there's the outcomes that we're seeking for those urban areas, which is to provide a, a greater variety of homes, also a greater variety of sites for businesses. Um, affordability is a very important aspect, as, as we all know, it's very uh, topical uh, and, and looking to accommodate growth so, to, so as to provide for that affordability. Uh, accessibility, the ways we get around between our homes and our towns uh, to be able to walk and cycle if that's what people choose and to be able to uh, you know come and go and, and have that accessibility to the properties and to businesses. Um, we need to support reductions in carbon emissions. The, that's been clearly directed by central government and uh, so that's something we need to factor into our, the policy for our urban areas and how our urban areas develop. Uh, we need to be supporting those outcomes. And finally, of course, we need to be resilient to natural hazards. So we're looking at all of our towns and villages to see how we can achieve those outcomes there, uh, as well as several other, which I'll get onto shortly. For our rural areas, uh, it, it, with the several topics that we've looked at here, which are, which are difficult, uh, balancing our rural living, which does support co rural communities, but it also can produce a lot of carbon emissions from transport. So how do we balance those two issues? Uh, several other aspects with rural areas, such as accommodating workers, uh, some of the tricky um, places to live next to, such as quarries and commercial activities. Uh, and there's also... Uh, quite a significant change for the rural three zone uh, so if, if any of the um, people attending the, um, the the webinar uh, have an interest in the rural three zone which li lies between uh, there was a sort of coastal Tasman area around Mapua then there's um, it's it's worth reading that aspect uh, I'll actually just take um, a quick second here if anyone ha does have a particular interest in a particular town or village if there's any one you want us to cover further then please just put that in the Q&A um, section and, and let us know if you live in a particular town then I'm happy to as I go on talk about that town further just to make it relevant to you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Several other topics that the uh, the document then goes through uh, we focus on light, signs, 
uh, which uh, just considering how can we protect the night sky uh, and the quality of the night sky. We look at signs. Uh, what is the policy for signs? Should we allow more signs? Are there too many signs in our environment? Uh, what can we do about that? Uh, notable trees and historic heritage. We're calling for nominations for additional trees that uh, that may warrant protection. They would be assessed to see whether they do so or not. And the same for historic heritage buildings. So are there buildings out there that we don't currently protect that possibly we should? Energy and infrastructure, again, looking at the policy around energy, how do we support energy outcomes that may be uh, renewable generation locally? We don't have a great deal of renewable energy uh, generation. Um, and how do we support our really important infrastructure uh, through policy settings? And finally, transportation, and that looks at uh, a range of transportation outcomes that will support uh, walking, cycling, transition towards electrification, uh, and also supporting a high quality urban environment so that we're not wasting land under, um, under asphalt, but that we're actually able to really utilize and provide compact urban form uh, with really efficient transport. So those are the, some of the topics that uh, this first this document is asking some direct questions about. So we really encourage, if you're interested in any or all of those topics, to go into the discussion document, and look at the questions that we're asking on those topics. Okay, moving on in a little bit more detail on Tasman's towns and villages. Now we do have uh, Mary Honey on the call and she's really been the powerhouse behind uh, this work uh, in, in going through, all through the towns and the villages uh, and looking at the issues and the options for each of the towns and villages. So here they all are. <laughs> We've got a, um, a, a fair number of them and uh, Mary's been through all of these towns and villages uh, and as I say, looking at the issues and options. Um, there's some key outcomes for all of these, and I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself slightly here, but we uh, have been working with our iwi partners and their aspirations uh, for the places that they live and that their whanau live. Uh, we need to implement the Nelson Tasman Future Development Strategy. Some of you may have been involved in that. Uh, it was landed or well, finished in about middle of 2022. Uh, it's a new, it's a document which guides at a high level, where is our growth going to occur? and how is it going to occur? And that really sets the scene. But we need to pick up that future development strategy and we actually need to implement that in the plan and provide the, the zoning and the tools to actually make it happen on the ground. Climate change mitigation and adaption. Our towns need to uh, both adapt to climate change in terms of the challenges it's going to throw up, such as sea level rise, uh, but also we need to change the way our towns function to mitigate climate change, to, to deal with some of the emissions challenges that we've got and to play our bit in that space. Uh, we also want our towns and villages to be uh, attractive and um, and to be great places to experience things. So pe people go to town less so now to buy things, but they go to town to have experiences, to buy coffee, to buy a drink, to meet friends, to have their kids play on the playground and so on. So we need to bear that in mind. And of course, that connection that I talked about earlier. Uh, the work that we've done, we've been through what we know, what are the iwi interests and values, uh, what have we got planned by council? So under our long-term plan, uh, of course, we have, uh, council has expenditure and plans for our different towns and villages. We go through what the community has told us, and that's from that first round of engagement that Barry mentioned back in 2020, uh, and then looking at the issues, op opportunities, and the policy directions. So really, that's uh, that, that's what we've looked at for our towns and villages. I won't go into any more detail than that. But as I say, there's with through the Q and A, more than happy to talk specifically. And we have Mary on the call also to talk specifically about the any towns and villages that you're particularly interested in. Uh, we're not so planning Jeremy, to go through this one at a time. Yes, we've had um, a request for a little bit more information about Marahau and sure. Takaka. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Takaka, uh, I'll start with. Uh, um, no, I'll start with Marahau uh, and. I might pull Mary into the call here uh, shortly if she'd like to make a comment. Um, Marahau is particularly uh, challenging from because of its servicing difficulties. So in terms of the direction forward, um, there isn't a great anything particularly planned for Marahau from a growth point of view. And so that, that's really where we're, uh, um, that's sort of the, the position we're starting from is that Marahau doesn't have the services that really requires to grow in any particular way. So. The, the key aspect, I think, for Marahu, uh, that as far as I'm aware, um, and I'll get Mary to maybe speak in a little bit more detail, is around its character, its proximity to the national park, and and, and as I'm sure that um, the the viewer will be aware that uh, that uh, the the possibly the tension between uh, the 
sort of a holiday the the way people live there and the sort of the, the nature of the way people live and how that sits against the um the tourist elements so i think retaining the character the existing character of maraho is sort of the feedback we've had so far and that's and in its proximity to the national park as well and so that's something i think that will be the key driver there so it's not proposed that there's a great deal of change for maraho um mary would you like to jump in there and, and either correct me or or elaborate thanks jeremy <clears throat> yes, that does seem to be the feedback we're getting. Um, I think everybody is very aware that there's, there is land in Marahau that is um, zoned but deferred for urban development, residential and commercial, or commercial tourist services. And it's really extremely difficult to service um, because of the underlying geology and the risk of flooding and sea level rise. So there is a feeling that enough is enough and um, really to focus on um, keeping the very, very special um, coastal and rural character for the village. Um, the, the, there will be some discussions on coastal hazards, I think, scheduled for next year. And obviously, Maraha would be part of that. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Yeah, so that's a really important point, actually, that... I mentioned right at the start that this is about half the topics that we're dealing with. And the second tranche of work uh, that we'll be uh, consulting on in the middle of next year, that's actually when our, the response to our coastal hazard work, well, I should have say hazards generally, that work will come along. So we'll be looking in more detail as how do we respond to the coastal sea level rise challenge we have right around the coast. And just as Mary says that um, Maraho and also places like Motueka and so on, uh, that will be very important and, and a, a, an additional part of the puzzle as to how we respond in the, these towns and villages. Uh, for Takaka, uh, a little bit of a different story there. So for, for, for Takaka, if you actually go to the discussion document and the, um, the one page of documents that we have, we haven't actually asked any particular questions for Takaka. Now, there's a good reason for that. What we are planning in 2023 is to, um, well, well backing up slightly, we recognize that Takaka has actually had very little attention for quite a number of years. So uh, the zoning is essentially as it was when the Tasman Resource Management Plan was um, first um, drawn up. Uh, there has been some tweaks, but there's been very little attention. So what we're proposing in 2023 is that we're going to commence what's called a structure plan. And we will have environmental policy staff actually working directly with the community to, um, to do some visioning work and develop, okay, what is a long-term plan for Taika? What needs to change from a zoning point of view, from a um, you know, what are the aspirations of the community? And I know there's been a lot of work done there by um, a community group there that's that's looked at this. So we're, and we're at, we've been in communication with that group and we'll be picking up that, um, I can't remember what it's called, the 2040, 2050 group, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Uh, what that is, picking that work up and then continuing that forward, working with those people and the community broadly to say what are the aspirations uh, for reserves, for growth, for housing, for zoning, for businesses, for industry, and coming up with a, a plan, a spatial plan that we can actually use to roll out. So um, anyone on the call who's interested in Atakika, please stay in touch for next year. And we'll be doing um, what the stuff we're talking about here, but in a much greater level of detail. I really encourage you to get involved in that because that will be a, a really good exercise to, to move Atakika forward um, to, to its next stage. So there's a question that's come in just um, on the Marahau um, topic around has any consideration been given to protecting the higher elevation land for future use if managed retreat is necessary? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a, good, that's a really, really good point. Now, um, um, yes, indirectly. So I, I mentioned earlier on that there was a change of direction for the rural three zone. Uh, now that's an area that is actually zoned, uh, so I'll, I'll come back to Marahau, but it's, it's an area between uh, Appleby and Motueka, which has currently zoned for some development. Now that is the approach that we're taking there uh, for that area of land to actually say it's not appropriate to have development there because it, it's a very appropriate location for long-term uh, managed retreat for, for potentially new settlements to go in the longer term. So we need to avoid having it cut into lifestyle blocks now because essentially that loses that opportunity. Um, very much the same for Marahou, but uh, it's it's not currently under pressure. So we don't have rural residential zones. As far as I'm aware, I haven't got the maps in front of me, uh, but the, yes, there are higher areas up the, um, the Marahou Valley and in some of those higher areas Yes, that remains an option for the future, and that's a very good reason why we wouldn't be 
considering uh, zoning some of those higher areas for um, either uh, residential or rural residential development. Um, it, 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 it avoids the issues of um, carbon emissions from transport now uh, and the double bonus, it, provi it actually provides those long-term locations for managed retreat as time goes on. So you know, I think it's a very a valid comment and a very good comment and um, and that's part of our thinking, absolutely. I think we'll um, we'll cover one more sort of broad question here on the towns and villages mm -hmm. aspect of things before we look to move on, because um, time's getting away from us a little bit. Um, and there's two questions here which both relate to protecting fertile areas of land in the region. So the Waimea Plains and some of the areas around Upper Mutari, um, what's being done to protect those for horticulture or agriculture or civiculture use and avoiding um, sort of densification in those areas. Okay, so um, in a general sense, uh, we actually do, we have quite relatively strong rules already for our rural one zone, which is our most productive zone. Um, there has been some fragmentation uh, in, in shall I say, earlier days, in the earlier 2000s and the 90s in the Waimea Plains. Um, a lot of that is largely um, stopped now with a um, strengthening of the rural one zone rules. Uh, so we've actually seen a really a stabilisation in that and, and subdivisions of that just cannot happen really um, at, at down to a small lifestyle block level. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the government has just released a new national policy statement. It's called the National Policy Statement for High Productive Land, Highly Productive Land, and that sets a much higher bar for any loss of productive land in whatever form that may be. So that's a new, uh, it literally came into effect about two weeks ago, uh, and so that it, it raises the bar even further. So um, it's very, very difficult now um, to develop highly productive land for purposes, unless it's for the purpose and it's very well demonstrated that it's really needed for to accommodate growth. So it does have to sit alongside growth. So in the, the, the uh, sorry, the Richmond um, example, we are prioritizing uh, the intensification of Richmond, and we clearly heard that message through the future development strategy. We have a large project that is uh, kicked off just uh, um, this year and will be progressing through a lot of next year. And that's going to be really focused on how can we really push intensification in Richmond. Uh, we do, and, and, and as such, we have, um, poor, I think it's fair to say, paused the Richmond South work. And you may be aware of that, that, that there's an area of land south of Richmond down um, towards Hope. So it just approaches Hope um, uh, past White's Road, close to Ransau Road. And uh, that is a new div greenfield development area where the land is productive, but it's already quite subdivided and fragmented into smaller lifestyle blocks so it tends not to be used in a productive way so that's the growth area we're looking at but our main priority is on the intensification of Richmond so that's how we're approaching that in the Upper Mutari situation um, yes there is um, productive land around Upper Mutari the real challenge there and, we, and I should say that the future development strategy didn't propose any growth around Upper Mutari really for that reason but also because of the servicing challenges uh, there has been quite a lot of interest in developing Upper Mutari because it's you know it's got the really really great sort of core of a community and um, and the community a lot of people have said actually it's a really good core there it could be growing some more people more kids at the school and, and so on um, the challenge we've got is it hasn't hasn't got the servicing and without the wastewater servicing it's very difficult to add more houses without them being very distributed and without them being very spread out. So we can't really intensify that town centre. So at the moment, we're not proposing any intensification of Upper Mutari. Whether that occurs in the long run, you know, in the very long run, um, if servicing can be provided up there because the, the Motueka wastewater treatment plant has to be moved and that may provide for servicing and then we could provide houses which don't spread out and take up productive land. So it's a bit of a puzzle, um, but at, at the moment, it's a bit of a status quo for Upper Mutari too, for similar reasons to Marohau. Uh, I could Mary, add, yes, yes, yes I could add to Upper Mutari, the future development strategy did consider some rural residential um, growth around Upper Mutari and the feedback from the community was not very, um, uh, the community wasn't terribly keen and then in terms of really um, growth, strategic growth direction, Upper Mutri really um, isn't on a major bus route. 
Mm. Um, it, it doesn't fall within the natural direction of strategic growth. Yeah. So upper, uh, upper military has received quite a lot of consideration, but um, one way or another at the moment, it's fallen on the side of leaving it where it is and trying to connect what's there up better mm. and trying to really um, just consolidate that lovely commercial hub that it has mm. um, at the moment. Thanks, Mary. So yes, Andrew, I see there's a couple of other um, questions there. So so let's just leave those and I'll come, I'll, I'll have a look at those and we'll come back to them eh, if we move on. Thanks. So yeah, so thanks very much. And I'll um, I'll hand over to Lisa. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I'll be covering off a few high level slides on our mountains to see um, and the feedback that we are looking for at the moment for our freshwater and coastal plan development. Um, there's, if you do need more detail, we do have a pre-recorded webinar uh, from a few weeks ago dedicated to the mountains to see, and that's on our Shape Tasman uh, website. Um, but I just remind you, do put the questions in the chat if you have any. Um, if we do run out of time today to answer any of those, we will be going through and answering them and putting those answers up on Shape Tasman. So please do put them in, in the chat. Um, so... Our freshwater and coastal work um, goes through a bit of a, a different process than the rest of the plan um, and that runs alongside the plan development. We will be coming back to the community in 2023 to talk about our issues and options, particularly for freshwater. Um, but we've also got a process at the moment that is driven through our national policy statement for freshwater. Um, and Jeremy, if you just go through the next slide. So this is just a high level slide around, around that general process and we're following a similar process for our coastal environment work as well. Um, it's got similar requirements under the New Zealand Coastal uh, Policy Statement. Um, and it's kind of broken down into a couple of steps. The first is figuring out where the frameworks um, should apply. So in the coastal space, that's the coastal environment area. Um, and in the freshwater uh, space, that's our freshwater management units. Um, from there, we look at what our goals are, what we want to aspire to. So we're uh, looking at developing long-term visions for our freshwater um, in each freshwater management unit and across the coastal environment. Um, and then from that, we look at what are our values of water. So what are the things in those spaces um, that are important that we would like to see protected? And what are the outcomes that we are wanting for each of those values? Um, the other key thing um, that we're looking at at the moment is what are the pressures, particularly in our coastal space, um, as well as our fresh water bodies. So um, what's going on at the moment that maybe needs to look, be looked at and what does the plan need to look at to um, do things a little differently? Um, and in terms of the, um, particularly in the freshwater space, off the back of the um, outcomes, we also identify parts in the plan, um, including attributes, um, the target states that we want those attributes to be in, um, and the limits and rules in the plan. And all of that is essentially focused on achieving the outcomes and those long-term visions. Um, Jeremy, if you just flip through the next few bits. So um, the coastal environment work um, in terms of figuring out where the coastal framework applies was looked at it through 2021 to 2022 and I'll show you a map of that shortly. Um, but currently the feedback round that we're looking at is um, after feedback on our freshwater management units, the long-term visions for both our freshwater and coastal spaces, um, the values that we have um, for water and both the coast and our freshwater bodies um, and also the pressures. Um, Jeremy on more and we'll be coming back in 2023 as well to talk about the outcomes for the values and then getting into more detail about what's required in the Tasman environment plan um, to achieve all those things. Next slide thanks. So um, the first part of that um, as I mentioned before is the coastal environment mapping so um, this extends out to the coast uh, the council marine boundary so that's 12 nautical miles that's the blue line there on the map. Um, and the inland boundary was mapped in uh, through 2021 um, by a panel of experts um, and that's the black line that's on the map um, and that is based on areas where coastal processes and patterns dominate the land. Um, so as part of development of that line uh, that went out for public and landowner feedback processes through 2022 and there were main amendments made to that line. Um, so the the what you see on that map is our current draft and the coastal environment area is all of that area between that blue line and the black line. Um, next slide, thanks Jeremy. So these are our um, draft freshwater management units. We have eight 
through the Tasman region, um, Aorere West Coast in the red there, Takaka in the orange, Abel Tasman, Kaiteritari in green, the dark green, Mochwekeru Waka in the blue, Muteri in the that pink colour, Waimea in the peachy colour, um, and the upper bullet in that light green. Um, we also have quite a special uh, FMU in that dotted um, space there, which is the deep Muteri groundwater, and that's looking at two um, very deep uh, aquifers that have um, a much more limited um, relationship with what's going on at the land surface um, and so they have quite specific management challenges and so we've put those into a, a dedicated FMU of their own. Um, so these freshwater management units are essentially catchment based so we're following where the water flows. Um, they look at uh, the surface and groundwater connections within each of these areas um, and we've also grouped catchments that flow into the same coastal area. So for example around the Waimea Inlet um, we're looking at all of the catchments for the Waimea River but also around through Mapu as well, um, the ones that flow into the Waimea Inlet and with our combining plan with Nelson we'll also be looking at the Stoke and Roding catchments over in the Nelson district as well. Um, we've also looked at grouping communities that have shared interests um, as well as the specific management needs um, for the water bodies in each of these catchments. Um, and in terms of the feedback we're looking for at the moment, um, online at Shape Tasman, we've got some questions around um, whether you think we've got the boundaries of the FMUs um, right, and also whether you agree with the catchment groupings that we've put through. Next slide, thanks Jeremy. Um, so as I mentioned before in, in our diagram, the, the next step is to talk about our visions for these areas. Um, and visions are aspirational and possible um, statements that what we want the future to be and they need to be aspirational and they need to be possible. Um, so I guess it's about thinking about what we want Tasman's freshwater and coastal environments to be for now but also in the future and for future generations. Um, and online at Shape Tasman we've got um, some feedback questions asking for your visions across both coastal and freshwater environments across a 10 year, 30 year and 100 year time frame. Um, and I guess it's about asking you to think about how you interact with our freshwater and coastal environments, how you use water in your daily lives, um, and sort of go through a thought experiment. You know, if you visited your favourite freshwater or salty places, um, you know, now or in 10 years or in 30 years or 100 years, um, what would you like it to be and, and what would you change if you could um, from what is there today? Um, next slide, thanks. So the next um, piece of um, feedback we're after is your values of water. Now we've got some um, specific values that are um, provided in the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water. Uh, there's four compulsory national values that apply to all water bodies in Tasman. Um, and there's another eight national values that we also have to consider as to whether they apply in Tasman. Um, can you just go through the next one? Next couple of, you might as well pull them all up, Jeremy. Um, so we've used the same approach for coastal because when we were looking at um, the values and their definitions, we realized that they could equally apply to coastal areas. Um, but we're not limited to just those 12. Um, we can also include any other values that our community identifies. Um, and as an example, we've provided 11 additional values that were identified by the Nelson community through their Nelson um, draft plan process. Now, all of these values are um, defined and outlined on our Shape Tasman um, website and we also have an interactive map and there's a snapshot of it there um, where you can go online and and drop a little pin on the map um, for the values and, and show us where you think they apply. Um, there's also an option to add another um, pin and you can um, add in your own value and your own uh, definition of that value. So um, this is a really key um, part of the framework. Um, in terms of the, the freshwater plan and, and the coastal plans um, will be driving to protect the values that our communities identify. So it's really important that we get that feedback from you all to understand exactly what those are and where. Lisa, and we've, got a, we've got a question that's come through that relates directly to this. And it's, um, someone says, so far they've only seen a bleak reference to marine subtidal habitats in um, the Shape Tasman website and the only water quality seems to be under consideration in those areas. Where would consideration of the now very scarce valuable marine habitat sit in these processes? Um, so certainly in terms of the, the values that we've got identified, um, 
sort of ecosystem health is is a key one um, and that that applies equally in the freshwater as, as it does in the coastal space um, so certainly if that's if that's something that um, the community wants to identify if there's specific areas in the Tasman marine environment that they would like to see um, better protected or um, change how we manage those areas then definitely uh, get on that map and drop a pin and, and, and let us know. Um, we're certainly aware of, of quite a lot of the issues already um, in the coastal space um, and we do have work going on um, looking at coastal biodiversity um, to, to, to see what is there currently. Um, but yeah, certainly by all means, we're after um, information from the community about what they have, what they're aware of and um, what they know about that, um, yeah, that we might not already know. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of quite specific questions here around um, the freshwater and marine um, topics. So one is, um, is there a record of the specific amendments made to the coastal environment line and the grounds for these amendments? Uh, so yes, there is. Um, and there are reports on that process and the outcomes of that process. Um, and you can find links to those on the Shape Tasman site. Um, there is also further information on co um, Council's website as well around that. So it has all been documented. Um, and I understand that the, um, the reports include a map that show the, the bits that have changed. Yeah. Thank you. And um, the other question that was a little sort of reasonably similar is, will FMUs have different target states and how are they decided on? Um, so potentially it, it will depend on the, the attribute that we're talking about. Um, some may be set um, at a regional level, just particularly if there's a specific science or ecology driver for um, that attribute. Um, but yeah, it's conceivable that um, different different FMU will end up with those. Um, and the process that we go through, um, again, it depends on the attributes. Some of them are very science um, driven, others will be based more on local knowledge. Um, but those processes will go through a round of um, specific community engagement to talk about um, the current states of those attributes, um, any baselines that might be set, and then the the target state that we're trying to get to. And the, the target states can be aspirational as well. Um, and if we're not anywhere near the target state currently, then we're required to set interim targets um, to meet those target states over time. So we need to have an interim target at least every 10 years. So that's a, that, that'll be a discussion with the, the community um, in, in the future uh, once we've gone through the next few steps in terms of um, identifying the values and outcomes and then the next step is identifying what, what attributes we need to measure to make sure that we're actually um, meeting the needs of those values. Thanks Lisa. Um, we'll do one more um, in your area quickly although it doesn't look like it's going to be a quick answer it's a reasonably long question. Um, do I understand it correctly that you want to formulate long-term visions for FMUs and understand the community's values for freshwater via an online form and by dropping pins on an interactive map. It seems to me that this process will require much more sustained and deliberative discussions with the communities and will need to put communities at the heart of the process in a meaningful way. Look at the diversity of interests in a catchment like the Waimea. It is not a straightforward task to gauge the community's values and visions. Yeah, that, that's, a re that's a really good question. Um, and I guess we sort of see this as the start of a conversation with the communities. Um, one of the very first things that we want to sort of um, discuss is, is those FMUs because the entire framework uh, is centered around those freshwater management units. Um, and as we start collating information about those areas, um, we want to make sure that we're, we're looking at the right places together. So certainly this is the start of that conversation. It's um, we're certainly, um, we're not necessarily starting from scratch in Tasman either. We have had some processes going um, in the past. So we had a freshwater collaborative group um, working in the target catchment between 2014 and 2019. And there's some really great um, information and outputs that came out of that, that process. Um, and we had a similar one that was started in the, um, the Waimea um, catchments. Um, and that's being progressed through a slightly different um, mechanism under our Waimea Nitrate project. 
Um, so yeah, certainly this this isn't the the only opportunity that um, our community will have to inform us in terms of what the visions and values should be. It, it really is just the start of the process. So we will be coming back in 2023, um, you know, for, with more opportunities um, to discuss discuss this work. And we also have, I should say, we also have a separate process um, running alongside this with Te Tau Ihu Iwi um, to talk about their visions and values of water as well. So, yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Um, is there more of the presentation to carry on with? Yeah, there's a couple more slides. All right, let's go. Cool. Um, so the final thing that we are interested in getting feedback on um, are the pressures there and act, um, activities that um, might be of concern in the areas um, within the coastal environment and also freshwater bodies. Um, so I guess in terms of particularly the, the coastal strategic work is, is really asking the question around what are appropriate activities and what are inappropriate activities in these areas. Um, but the same question can be asked um, in the freshwater space as well. And th the other um, aspect too is, is this um, idea that at some point, you know, some activities that can be acceptable actually start to become unacceptable maybe once numbers or a scale or that kind of thing starts increasing. So um, as I said before, we're very aware of a lot of the existing pressures and threats, but obviously, you know, things are changing. Um, we're having better science understanding of what's going on in the environment. Um, there's also changing expectations in our community as well. Um, so we want some feedback on, on those aspects. Um, and again, there's a separate section on our Shape Tasman site where you can go and log in what you think the current and also future pressures. Um, so things that might not necessarily be pressures now, but you can sort of see them coming um, that the, the new plan should be considering. Next slide. Oh, I think that's um, that's the last one. So just, just in terms of a, an overview, in terms of the feedback um, that's on, um, shape Tasman. So um, as Jeremy pointed out before, there's the, the three different parts, the environment and development um, section, the towns and villages, and the mountains to see. So you're welcome to feedback on any of those aspects that you um, want to provide input in. We'd love to hear from you on everything, but um, obviously if you've got something specific you'd love to um, give us feedback on, then, then please do so. And um, and this feedback round ends on the, the 20th of December. Great, thank you for that, Lisa. Um, so we've, our panelists can actually see all the questions that we've got that have come in at the moment. Are there any that people would like to talk about the um, questions and discuss some of the answers? Shall I pick some that I think might be um, relevant? Um, there certainly seems to be a fair bit of concern around intensification in areas that um, are prime productive land. So there's a question here, how are you managing reverse sensitivity impacts on primary production or enabling production in areas like Waimea with increased urban development? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really important uh, point that, and, it's, um, and we are aware of it, that the the more houses you have over your boundary, if you're a productive, um, if you're a grower or a um, agriculturalist of any sort, really, uh, it does constrain um, the, the use of your land, and we we, we have that feedback very often. Um, so I think, and I should also say that that is a um, a point that's been well made in the new um, national policy statement for highly productive land that we actually have to explicitly turn our mind to now, uh, but. What, what we try and do is um, provide what, what we'd call a natural barrier. Uh, so, for example, the Richmond South work, reimagining Richmond South program that, that, we're, that we're looking at, which I said is paused, but um, the, the, the boundary of that uh, that we're looking at at the moment that we'd take that through would actually be a, um, a stream, a, 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 a drainage, let's say a drainage um, channel. Uh, and so, th and that would be a channel that can be restored. So, this is just an example. Um, so, you can actually provide instead of it being a boundary between houses and then straight into the productive land which does cause that reverse sensitivity it would be a um a, a stream corridor which may be 30 40 possibly even 50 meters wide to accommodate flood flows and so we, we look for boundaries like that in order to separate urban from rural 
and I think as a more general, um, in a more general sense, the the we do recognise uh, that issue, and uh, I guess a, a philosoph philosophical point for the the plan generally is to work with that and to look at our urban, intensify our urban areas, have clear, strong boundaries to our urban areas, uh, and um, don't develop those rural areas. So there's less. Uh, there's very little in the way of proposals for rural residential for allowing more people to live uh, in a uh, you know relatively dense way in the rural environment in whatever form that might be. So I think that's really the approach we're taking is to consolidate and separate the activities because that's what seems to work best. And where we where they do, are side by side, we have quite substantial setbacks, which I think are 25 meters. Um, Mary can let me know if I'm wrong, but I'm, I think the setback is 25 meters, so it does provide a good setback from the boundary. Thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, there's quite a specific question here around the coastal environment line, but um, I suspect it's not quite what you're talking about, Lisa, and this is around the requirement for stainless steel fixings in construction that falls inside the coastal environment. Um, as someone who grew up in Wellington, or lived in Wellington for quite a long time and then tried to build a house in Nelson a long way from the sea. I was a bit surprised they thought there might be salt spray where I was living. Um, but I don't think that's quite connected to what you're doing, is it, Lisa? No, certainly not. The the, the coastal feedback that we're after under the mountains to see is, is very much at that high level visions and values stuff. Um, but I think, um, Jeremy, you might want to talk to the the coastal environment um, questions that we've got in the environment development discussion document. Yeah, I think that specific question too is um, around building code requirements by the look of it around yes. requirements for, for stainless steel. But, but look, we'll, we'll follow that up anyway <clears throat> and provide a response to, um, to that person. Um, we'll see what we can find out for them. Thank you. Uh, yep. And there are some more questions here around um, resilience of natural systems and land use planning to foster vibrant lowland ecosystems and connect these with existing seed stocks and bird populations in land. Um, is that something kind of runs across Jeremy and Lisa's um, topics here, I think? Yeah, and that's... Um, yeah. Uh, oh, you go, Jeremy, sorry. Um, you no, know, no, that's okay. Um, look, yeah, I think there are those aspects, and I think Lisa might want to, um, to talk there also, but um, some of the biodiversity aspects, and I think there was a mention of, uh, and one of the questions also about the um, uh, the SNAs as well, significant natural areas. Um, we're, again, it's, it's not a very satisfactory answer, but some of these aspects we kind of ha still have to kick down the road because we are waiting for um, central government direction. So the uh, um, people may be aware that there's a national policy statement for um, indigenous biodiversity and that again that's another piece of national direction uh, which will apply over the whole of New Zealand which will direct certain outcomes in that regard uh, but so we're waiting for that because that will guide our, our policy uh, we do have to uh, respond to that national direction um, but it's it's very much something that we're looking at where the um, Nelson City Council has had um, and Mary, you might want to talk here further because it's in, in Mary's area, but the biodiversity corridors have been something that have been in Nelson's plan for a while. And it's something that we um, will certainly be looking at is how can we achieve biodiversity corridors? Um, those streams are the, the obvious one. And so I think around restoring stream corridors uh, to uh, uh, ecologically functioning width, um, so it's not just the stream itself, but the vegetation on either side is, is going to be a, um, a, a key aspect of that. Um, Mary, did you want to just talk a little bit more about your thoughts on the on the biodiversity area? Sure, Jeremy. Um, well, the new plan does certainly, and the new planning standards provide an opportunity for natural urban space zones and um, sort of bio biodiversity corridors or eco corridors really would fit into that. And so um, we're, we're planning an exercise for the new plan that will um, look at, 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 at various aspects, the, um, the, the, the topography, the water bodies, the, um, the, the, the land cover. And there might be some very, very obvious ecological corridors that we could zone natural earth space. Um, 
but it's it's an exercise we're looking we're looking at for the new plan so it's quite a big step forward um bearing in mind that there's a lot of sensitivity uh, uh, around there's a, a, a lot of new um legislation coming at rural landowners at the moment and um so the work needs to be done in consultation with landowners. Is that enough? Mm -hmm. yep. And I'll, I'll just add to that too. I mean, we've got some pretty clear direction already um, from central government in terms of the National Policy Centre for Fresh Water and Tamano Te Wai, um, which quite, you know, highlights ecosystem health of water bodies. Um, is, is you know really high it's our first priority um, and similarly in the in the coastal space with the New Zealand coastal policy statement and um, you know I think that that's only going to grow as we transition through to the new acts that are replacing the RMA so that talks about te rano, te taio, so the health of the, um, the wider environment so um, I think in terms of the the biodiversity and ecosystem health aspects it's it's you know it is squarely within the the new plan and I think our challenge um, in the planning space will be making sure that we have that sort of consistent approach in terms of how we um, protect and enhance our biodiversity across the freshwater and the coastal and the, the terrestrial environments together. Thanks for that and, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, go Barry. That's right and I just say and and we have to balance that against yes. against our, our primary economies as well about you know, how do we continue to produce food? How do we continue to look after our communities? So it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, there's, there's some very big and very hard nutty questions that we're, that we're working through at the moment. So, you know, balancing our environment, our obligations around environmental protection and enhancement and biodiversity with um, the needs to, to feed our communities as well and, and sustain our communities socially and economically. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a very simple question that's come up, um, which I'm hoping you perhaps have a very simple answer to, Jeremy, which is how do you balance conflicting values and the example they've given is the need to preserve productive land versus aspirational target states. I think there might be a, uh, yeah, I think I, it's the Lisa one. I can chip in there. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a water one. Yeah. yeah, so that right. is a, that is a, another really good question um, and it is going to be a real challenge um, and it's going, we, we're going to have some interesting uh, discussions with our community in the, in the next couple of years, I think. Um, I, I guess in, in my mind it starts to boil down to having a think about what it is that we can do to uh, you know sustain our productive um, land and food security and that kind of thing um, while protecting the environment um, and I think in, in a lot of cases a lot of those discussions will be around the time frames it takes to get there you know what what can actually be done in an affordable manner um, and um, but also at the same time you know meeting the expectations of the community in terms of the the speed of, of achieving those um, those aspirational targets so I think there will be some challenging discussions and a, and a good example of that is the Waimea Plains you know it's it's a significant fruit and vegetable growing area for not only Tasman region but the South Island generally and, and also the North Island uh, when bad weather hits them um, and yet we've got a you know well-known nitrate issue in the groundwater under those plains so you know we have to have a think about um, you know how those two things can can be progressed forward and um, and we have a, a specific project um, in that area the Waimea nitrate project um, which I'm anticipating will, will um, become a formal action plan under the national policy statement in, in the new year where we're discussing with with growers um, and they're already actioning um, some things um, in such as um, updating their farm environment plans um, looking at not track management um, yeah to, to work towards uh, those goals of reducing the nitrate that's in the groundwater underneath but yeah so not necessarily any silver bullets or easy answers here but um, I think you know it's it's these conversations are really important for developing the plan and not only the plan but um, the non-regulatory things that we might also put in place to achieve the goals over time. Thanks for that Lisa. Um, we've got a question here that I might actually be able to answer which is a strange one because I'm the comms person on the team here and the question is how do you ensure that those community discussions involve everyone and are fair i.e not just the usual squeaky wheels and that's something that we've put quite a bit of thought and effort into 
in this round of engagement, because traditionally we would have just gone out to the likes of residents associations to get comments on the kind of feedback that we're after. And um, this time around, we've tried to throw the net much more broadly. So we've, um, we've had hard copy documents that you can pick up and read and provide feedback in. We've actually gone out to a lot of the towns and villages in the region and done little pop-up events where people can come along and chat to the planners and to councillors, which was quite useful. Hopefully some of you will have attended some of those. And we're doing a big push on Shape Tasman, both to present the information that people need to make informed feedback and also provide a way of them giving that feedback to us. Um, and it's worth remembering that this is just one round of um, engagement that we're doing and there'll be another round coming in uh, 2023 and we'll hopefully try and do a better job then of reaching even more people. Yeah, it's, it's, perennial, it's a perennial challenge. I, I would add it's a perennial challenge to, to and get people to engage because these are really big and really important issues that affect all of us um, long term. Um, but it is really challenging and we're constantly striving to, to do better, I guess, and to, to improve on how we do that. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning that there is a completely separate stream of work that we do with local iwi to get all of their ideas and feedback on the, um, the areas we're working on. Um, we're also going to be engaging with youth in the region. So we're going to go out to some of the, the high schools and the youth councils to talk to them about various aspects of um, the TEP and get their feedback on those things. Um, overall, I think we've done a reasonably good job of reaching out to some to a wider range of people in this engagement um, exercise. Would that would be other people's opinion as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd just like to support. Um, I think the the, the pop-ups that we did were really good. We um we got um went to a number of the local schools. We, so we managed to uh, not not directly, but after schools, we managed to talk to um to parents who were taking their kids away from school. Uh, we um put ourselves outside shops and four squares and those sort of things. So people places where the people, the non squeaky wheel people, if you like, um, were going to be <laughs> anyway. That where they were coming and going from um, in their everyday lives, uh, and and found ways to get them online and um, and looking at this material. So we can only do what, do what we can do, and um, but I, I think we we made a pretty good fist of actually um, uh, you know trying to broaden the net, as you say, Andrew. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. We take information from, you know, any source we can get it really. And, and I guess the other the other one too is, you know, we get information from um, our colleagues in other departments about feedback that they're getting from um, the various sectors of the community that they're involved with. And that sort of happens throughout the year. So over time, it does build up to be, um, you know, quite a big picture about what the community is saying in general. Thanks, Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks like we've pretty much answered most of the, com the questions that have come in. Andrew, there's one there just about the energy and materials. I'm just happy to speak oh, to yes. that one. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you, yeah. Go for yeah, it. Yeah. So, it's no, a, so a big area. Be, yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. But there's one um, just so I won't go into in great level of detail. But um, the question is that there's um, about energy and materials resilient uh, and that it hasn't been covered. Um, to do and the, some of the examples that are given are um, with biomass energy um, and referencing Europe's energy crisis um, and also um, farm forestry and I think it's it's around um, so I think part of the, the question here is to do with um, utilizing biomass as an energy source uh, there, there is there's a very high le and if you look in the discussion document there is a high level discussion of energy um, but it certainly it is something that's currently supported, but that we're looking to support further. So I, I think it's an area where we would really like the feedback. What are the ideas around that and how can we support it? And I think that last bit's important because a lot of these um, outcomes that people like to see are actually going to be driven by the private sector. It's not something council is going to be doing. All we can do through this Tasman Environment Plan is set the policy to enable these sort of activities, set the rules so that they're permissive, and after that, it's up to the private sector to um, to, to actually provide the product, if you like. So in that case there, yes, we will absolutely um, be supporting uh, local 
renewable en energy generation in whatever form that takes. And there are some good examples and it does cross over in terms of these trade-offs between say our outstanding natural landscapes. Are wind farms appropriate in our outstanding landscapes? Probably not, but there may well be locations where solar farms are appropriate um, and they're not gonna have the impact. Um, biomass generation, absolutely, um, that, that could be possible too. And without researching it or looking at the rules directly, I actually don't think there's anything uh, that would make it too difficult at the moment. Happy to be corrected on that, and that's what this feedback is for. How? What, what are the obstacles to biomass generation at the moment? Uh, how can those obstacles be removed? Um, should we be removing them? Um, so if you've got information on that, by all means, put it in that energy and infrastructure section in the, um, in the online document, the online question slide. I think the evidence from Europe over the last few decades is that the issues around particularly biomass generation aren't anything to do with local council rules there are a lot to do with costs of transport and the economics of producing yep. the energy and then how you get that energy to where you're going to use it. Yep. So there's, yeah, it's quite a, so quite a complex area. Complex area. And we're, we're only one small piece in that, uh, one, one cog in that, in that machine. So, yeah. Uh, yes. The other aspect that's mentioned there is about the access accessibility of local food production. Um, again, um, I, I guess we achieve that through, uh, um, through ensuring that that land is available, um, that, uh, that uh, the most productive land is retained. We do have to, of course, balance that with um, with our need for for growth, appropriate growth. Uh, but by providing that food available, um, and then you know, you know, uh, we we need to. It was mentioned earlier on. There are farm, um, producers and landowners do have a lot coming at them. Um, so we, you know, we can't. Um, you know, cr crush what they do because they do produce the food that we need. So, so again, there's these balances here. Um, but uh, one other aspect I just will sort of uh, mention that we don't go into detail is we are looking also at some of the fundamentals uh, in Tasman around um, land, uh, around um, what lot sizes are necessary. So what, um, what property sizes uh, 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 may be necessary for the production of food at an efficient level. So we're very much looking at what are the fundamentals um, for Tasman in that rural space, uh, and and what should we, what are the settings and are the settings right for um, for subdivision that may or may not be allowed. So yeah, and that's right at the biggest level for, for at farm size as well. So so that's something we're going to be doing some more work on. Yeah, and in, in the fresh water space, we're also uh, looking quite closely at resilience in terms of um, enabling things like water storage to make sure that productive land uses, um, you know, are, are geared up to be resilient to drought situations, particularly where um, we may be in increasing sort of the protections for um, water bodies in terms of um, including more rationing and cease take triggers within the plan. So um, certainly the resilience and the food security aspect is, is, is part of that plan consideration. Thanks for that, Lisa and Jeremy. Um, unless people have got any more really pressing questions, um, we're probably getting close to the end of this webinar. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all the attendees. We've had some really useful questions and um, commentary from you. And anything that has come up that um, is effectively feedback will get pushed into the feedback process for this round of engagement. But I'd still encourage everyone who is interested in having their say to do so before the 20th of December, which is the deadline for this engagement round. Um, and the best place to do that is the Shape Tasman website. So you can Google Shape Tasman and it'll get you there or it's www.shape.tasman.govt.nz forward slash environment plan. Um, and yes, there's a lot more background information available there. And there's also the feedback forms and the maps you can use to drop pins and all the other ways of telling us what you think. So thank you very much to um, all our presenters and the people who've answered questions for us. And thank you to everyone that's attended this webinar. And yeah, we'll see you. You, see you for the next round of um, engagement in next year. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for attending. Cheers.